Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, Think In. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see me on screen. I hope you can. Um, uh, this is a Think In on an issue that has uh, been burning a hole in many pinstripe suits in the past few weeks. Um, namely, is £81,000 a year enough to be an MP? And many would say this is a non-question, given that the UK average salary is £31,000 a year. Others would say that it's wrong that the UK lags far behind other developed countries such as Australia, uh, where backbenchers take home about £120,000 a year. And others still uh, say that the expenses uh, and lobbying scandals we've seen over the years all have at their heart a kind of structural failure to recognise that the most talented people will always look for higher payment, and if they can't get it from their main job, they'll go moonlighting. And indeed, uh, Sam Friedman, uh, Tortoise contributor, wrote a, a very good uh, slow view for us on that, to that effect recently. Um, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise, and I'm joined in the chat by my colleague, Kat Whitfield, who will be looking after the chat uh, for the next hour. So please do chip in because we really want to hear your thoughts and particularly about where we should be going with this issue um, in, in, in the weeks and months to come. It's clearly one that exercises people and we would we'd love to hear where, where you think specifically and in a, as granular a way as possible we should be heading. We've got a terrific group of speakers, uh, Richard Bergen, uh, the MP for Leeds East, um, who is only with us until about seven because he has to go off and um, put down his second jobs bill, which is on this very theme. It could hardly be more topical. To Dr. Hannah White, um, Deputy Director of the Institute of Government and an expert on a whole variety of uh, political and constitutional issues. Uh, Dr. Nick Dickinson, um, a fellow in constitutional relations at Balliol College, Oxford, um, and Tom Brake, the director of Unlock Democracy, and himself a former Lib Dem MP. So a uh, poacher turned gamekeeper or the other way around, whichever you want to uh, uh, look at it as. Um, if Richard is here, I'd like to start with him because I know he has uh, time constraints. Is, is Richard available yet or not? Still waiting on Richard. Okay, um, let me go then to Hannah. Um, Hannah, thanks very much for, for joining us this evening um, and giving us your time. Uh, I suppose what I wanted to ask you is, is to start off at the basics, sort of level of first principles and how realistic it is that we do tend to approach this as an ethical issue uh, as much as a practical and structural one. Um, so for example, I was looking up the average um, salaries of head teachers, and it's really common for a head teacher now to make hundred thousand pounds a year. Some of them earn quite a lot more. Um, are we actually making a mistake here by almost being semi punitive towards MPs? So I think it's important to understand the context in which MP salaries were last sort of benchmarked and set, um, which was immediately obviously after the MPs expenses scandal and a big exercise was done and that lots of different ways were used to try to come up with the figure where they should start and then uh, since then they've gone up in, in line with an ONS index. But the, the starting point was a jump from where MPs were before the expenses scandal. Um, and the, the, the IPSA, in, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, who, who had to decide where to, where to stick MPs' salaries, did a number of things. They, they looked at baskets, as you say, of other people's salaries, sort of what you might say were comparable jobs, although there is obviously no job which is directly comparable to that of an MP. They did work with the public and they said um, to members of the public, focus groups and so on, you know, what do you think about this? And they really discovered that the public start from where they are. So if they're on a salary of 30K, they tend to think MPs ought to be paid about 30K. And if they're on a salary of 80K, they tend to think MPs ought to be paid 80K. And if they're on a salary of 150, likewise. So, so they did that. And then they looked at international comparatives and they drew all this together. And they came up with this figure at the time of, I think it was 74 
a thousand pounds, which has since gone up to about 82, as you say. Um, uh, but I think at the time, the crucial thing was it was in the aftermath of the expenses scandal. So whereas they might have gone for a higher figure, um, actually, I think they were constrained. They were already, there was a lot of concern at the time. We just had this scandal. People were saying, you know, this is outrageous what MPs have been doing. So I think Ipsa thought they ought to be on more, but they couldn't put it up too much at the time. And I think that's probably why we're sitting a bit lower than other countries, where other countries have landed up having presumably done quite similar exercises. Uh, so um, in, in, in that, with that in mind, Hannah, um, I, I mean, the, the question I suppose that one needs to ask right now is that we, we've been, we've tumbled towards this moment, thanks to a very specific um, event, which was the Owen Patterson affair, the, the kind of attempt to uh, jerry-rig a, 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 a new form of standards committee, that all fell apart. The next day, Jacob Rees-Mogg, leader of the House, announced a, a U-turn, they were going to back down on that, and the government has tried to come up with some form of, um, you know, uh, solution to the problem, which is in a, in a, in a sense a, really to restate the the question that if there is to be second uh, secondary work by MPs, it has to be at a reasonable level of reasonable limits. Uh, I suppose I suppose the question I want to ask you is whether you think what we're experiencing at the moment is one of those blips in in political life, or is this actually a moment that will yield something solid and systematic? So I think Westminster is probably on catch up here. If you look at the devolved legislatures, their rules on second jobs are much, in Scotland and Wales, are, are much tougher than they are in, in Westminster. Um, and I, you know, I think that there has been, although cross, not, I think it's interesting, there isn't actually cross-party agreement on the problem. There's been cross-party agreement on a solution of kinds, which is to ban consultancy type jobs. Well, there's a question about how we define those. And the government has gone a little bit further and said they want to impose reasonable limits. And there's a question about how you do that. Is that time? Is that money that people can earn? Um, and the Labour Party has said if they were in power, they go further still and ban all second jobs. Um, but I think that the, the, the there has been cross-party sort of agreement that there is, there is a, there's a problem to be solved. I think Boris Johnson has said it's about too much time spent away from doing what your constituents want. Mm -hmm. I think that the Labour Party is, is more, seems to be more in the direction of they sh people shouldn't be able to, to, to get all this additional money. Um, so the, uh, getting to an answer on, on what to do about it might be tricky because people are trying to solve slightly different problems. But I really hope that politicians do follow up on this because I think there has been cut through from this story and people have really noticed this stuff about second jobs. And if we get to January, which is the deadline that's been sort of set and nothing happens or something very minimal and another sort of, a little tweak happens, I think that's going to be a real missed opportunity. So I think at bare minimum, I would say we have to go to where Scotland and Wales are on this. Um, and potentially a little bit further. It'd be nice to see Westminster leading on this rather than always on catch-up. Can, can, you, can you set out to, for us uh, what, where Scotland and Wales are? So we can kind of... Yeah, yeah. So, so they have already, they have both of them for some years now. Um, I think uh, Scotland from the very start of when the parliament was set up had a rule that says you can't be a consultant, you can't be a consultant as a, a sort of political consultant. You can't do anything that's a sort of, um, because I'm an MP and I understand politics, I'm going to help your company understand politics. So that's completely banned. But they've also got right. much tougher rules on on um, hospitality gifts and, and other interests. So basically, if you have uh, received hospitality, been taken to the races, been taken to um, you know a football match, you are uh, you shouldn't accept any of that according to those legislatures whereas right. in Westminster MPs can take that sort of hospitality as long as they declare it I see okay Thank, thanks for now Hannah we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you Nick I, Nick I want to come to you and you've written about this whole matter um, with, with great understanding um, is it uh, you, you talk us through what, what you describe as the sort of the mismatch 
between paying MPs as if they were professionals and the attitude that says actually those pay levels should really be set within relation to the wages of those they represent, which are two completely different prisms through which to understand that. Can, um, can you elaborate mm. on that? Yeah, so I mean, I think it, I'm uh, kind of glad that we're, we're having this debate again, in a sense, because it's very easy to relegate these issues of pay to the sort of technocratic background of politics. It's not often something we think about politicians as being motivated by. Um, but of course, payment of MPs was among the Chartist's six demands. It's one of the fundamental things we need to do in order to have a democracy. Um, because unfortunately, you know, one of the, the, I think, things we need to understand to frame this debate is that uh, zero pounds would be enough to be an MP. You could fill those 650 slots by paying nothing. But the people that you would fill them with would be a very different kind of political class. Um, and I think as ever, sort of Max Weber sort of framed this very well in Politics as a Vocation, where he said that um, you know, if we're going to have a, a, a political class of any kind, it can either be on an honorary basis by independent people, which means the wealthy, um, or it can be uh, sort of staffed by people without access to private means, in which case it has to be remunerated. And I think that's what's got to be sort of borne in mind then when we think about any question of sort of how much should the political class be paid, um, that ultimately there is no market rate that we can refer to. This isn't really a market question. It's a question of the social value that we attribute to politics and to politicians. Um, and so then when we think about then that contrast that you mentioned, which is sort of most often I think what comes in in the modern debates, so the, you know, the idea that MPs should be paid in some sense the sort of average uh, wage, or they should be paid in some sense the sort of professional wage, isn't really a question about the sort of efficiency of parliament or motivations. It's a question about how people feel about their democratic representatives and what sort of person they want them to be. And I think there genuinely are two answers to that question. So on the one hand, um, nobody complains, for example, when they go to their doctor or if you go to a lawyer, that your doctor is too much of a professional. Um, but then, you know, they want them to be essentially sort of, you know, just like them. Um, it's not an argument that people make. And some people do also feel that way about their MPs. They want them to be skilled professionals um, who are capable of dealing with the complex problems um, that their constituents will come to them with. But at the back of their mind, at the same time, you tend to also find this question that, well, unlike in some of these other professions, that democratic link has to be sustained by more than just having being able to vote for your MP and anyone being able to stand to be an MP, that they have to understand in some granular sense the lives of their constituents. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why this debate comes up time and time again is because it does connect to some of those quite deep philosophical roots about what we assume democracy is for. Um, is it something which represents the people in some almost direct sense, or is it something which is a sort of uh, a structure which is meant to, um, in a kind of Burkean sense, provide people who have almost better judgment than you? Um, and where you come out on that, that again, philosophical or uh, question of political philosophy, explains a lot of where you come out on pay. Um, well, let's say we kick Burke to one side, mm. uh, send him rolling, tumbling down the hill. Um, <laughs> And, and, and we do look at, look at MPs pay um, from away from a position that you want your, somehow your betters to be representing you, mm. which I think very few people in contemporary society would uh, subscribe to. Where, where, where Nick, do you land? Um, I mean, do you, have a, um, do you have a figure in mind or do you have a, a or do you have, or, or, or perhaps some, some sort of um, algorithm, as it were, that, 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 that for you would be fair? So I'd, I'd say that the current level is about right. Um, it's also, incidentally, around the average um, internationally. So we can pick these kind of outliers like Singapore in one direction. There are also outliers in a lower direction. So within Europe, we could point to a country like Spain. Um, but we are sort of within the, within the sort of the envelope um, of what's politicians are usually paid. Um, I think the greatest advance really has not been so much in the level of pay, but in how successful IPSA has been in finally separating out pay from expenses. Because this has always been the great ambiguity, which is 
bedeviled this from the beginning, um, that the original pay to MPs, which was £400 from 1911, was a flat payment that was meant to pay both the upkeep of the MP and for everything they needed to do that job. Um, so in a sense, again, I think that the, the, the most interesting thing and the most important thing is not so much the level that you come to, because within a certain envelope, it won't affect the nature of the political class very much. But the level of resources you give them to do their job and the level to which those are separated from, thing which is very clearly designed to be remuneration, that's going to affect public view and public confidence much more than the actual level itself. Um, again, so long as we stay within that kind of broad envelope so, so of sort of two to three times national income, which that, most that, that, countries are in. That goes on to, that leads to another question, uh, Nick, mm. which is, um, which Hannah alluded to really, which is um, the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority um, set up after the expenses scandal. Has, is it working, do you think, in, in, in monitoring, overseeing the expenses and allowance structure? It's certainly working better than the previous system. Um, That's a fairly no low system, bar though, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's no system of independent regulation can be perfect. Um, not least because one of the, I think, problems with any kind of uh, independent regulatory solution is that it inherently lacks some democratic accountability. And that's kind of the point. So in exactly the same way that handing off, say, the setting of interest rates to the Bank of England will lead to a sort of technically more efficient system, one that's sort of prone to, to sort of fewer mistakes and a bit less secrecy. Um, it's also one which escapes the, um, the sort of bounds of democratic accountability through parliament. Um, and when it's so close to these issues that the public care about, I think a lot of the frictions generated by IPSA are inherent to the sort of frictions of an independent regulatory system. Mm -hmm. um, so although IPSA has done a very good job and has done the job that it's designed to do, there are inherent tensions there, which I don't think it's, there's, there's any regulatory model that can entirely escape that. That's great, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you soon. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tom, can I come to you? Um, and uh, you know ask you in turn um thank you very much for joining us and uh, and welcome um what you know what's your attitude to second jobs higher pay i mean do you do you have a kind of um a particular point of view on this yes i mean first of all i think there is a case for members of parliament earning slightly more than they do currently and i was interested in what hannah had to say about the the expenses scandal and the role that that played perhaps in setting MP salaries at a particular level when that review was carried out. Because for instance, judges, uh, judges start their salaries at 90,000 and uh, can earn over 250,000 a year. And of course, members of parliament are legislating and then judges are interpreting that legislation. So I think there is a case for, for, for paying more. Obviously, that is not something that uh, many MPs for various very obvious reasons are going to be able to argue. But I think that the quid pro quo has to be that uh, an end to second jobs. And there are clearly some second jobs which I think are already uh, sailing very close to the wind in terms of whether they are legitimate or not. Uh, strategic advisors, parliamentary advisors, uh, who are combining salaries, uh, performing those roles, for instance, and at the same time being on all party parliamentary groups that, that advocate for particular sectors. I think that is something which uh, should be stopped straight away. Now, whether you also ban uh, second jobs, for instance, in the public sector, I, mean, I would argue that a member of parliament who, for instance, you know, take the case to the extreme, who is spending all of their time uh, working as a doctor and spending no time on their, on their constituency or, or parliamentary business, then clearly there's a problem there as well. It might not be quite as, uh, as challenging as someone who's spending all of their time earning money uh, representing other countries abroad, for instance, but uh, I would argue that a member of parliament, the, the bulk of their time should clearly be spent on representing their constituents. Now, I know there's an argument that says, well, uh, it's down to the electorate for them to decide. But of course, uh, in many safe seats around the country, first of all, there will be constituents who don't support uh, the, 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 the party of the member of parliament who is currently representing that seat. And they really have no say in whether that uh, MP should continue 
uh, in their position, even if they have multiple second jobs, and also a member of parliament who has one or more second jobs is not really likely to be doing the, the thing that parliament requires them to do, which is to act as a, an effective legislator or an effective scrutineer of legislation. If their interest and their mind is elsewhere, uh, how can they be performing the job of a member of parliament, scrutinizing bills effectively, uh, challenging government ministers through parliamentary questions and so on. So yes, I think members of parliament uh, could uh, earn uh, more than, it, than they currently do, but the, the quid pro quo has to be uh, reducing the amount of, of time and effort and money they earn elsewhere. See, it's very, it's very interesting that, again, the way you frame it, it's fascinating because um, a lot of the discussion since the Owen Patterson affair broke has been to draw a fairly sharp binary distinction between, um, as it were, good second jobs and bad second jobs, for want of a better term, that there were second jobs which were honourable public service oriented, such as being a GP, being a surgeon, being in the reserves for various public services. Um, and so on, and, and wicked second jobs, which were exploiting um, political position for personal gain. What you're saying, Tom, I think is, is that, that no, you know, actually, it, it's also a question of time. Um, and I think that's a, that's a fascinating uh, point and one that perhaps hasn't been made enough. And so, uh, so what, what a follow up question I wanted to ask you was, you know, your, your organization unlocked democracy obviously looks at the, you know, a much broader panorama than just this. And, and, and how you see this question sitting in that broader debate? Uh, clearly we see it sitting very much in the center of the, the, the broader debate that you've referred to, because there's a real risk that, that what is happening around things like second jobs is that we are going to have a repeat of the expenses scandal. Now the expenses scandal, uh, which took place in 2009, the legacy of that is really still with us in terms of the level of, of mistrust uh, in politicians and, and politics more generally. If we're about to rerun the same thing uh, through, for instance, or because the government don't take firm action now in relation to second jobs and come up with some firm decisions in January, then I think for democracy, uh, that is a problem. And that there are measures that the government could take immediately. And we have written to the, the party leaders, so Unlock Democracy has written to the party leaders to ask them to request that all of their members of parliament who currently have a second job or a third job or a fourth job actually put into the public domain anything that they've got in relation to a contract or an agreement with the company that they're working for so that the, the public can actually see what it is that they're doing and then the public and their constituents can draw a conclusion as to whether their second, third or fourth job is in the interest of the country, as some, some members of parliament uh, will argue, or whether alternatively that second, third or fourth job is actually just in the interest of the, the income of that member of parliament. Tom, thank you. We'll, we'll come back to you shortly. I wanted, if I may, to come to Robert Campbell. Robert, I don't know if you're, um, you're there. Yeah, I am. Hi. Uh, good to see you. you, you you've been making some very interesting uh, points in, in the chat um, about some of the distinctions we've been discussing um, about, you know, the distinction between those who have specifically um, public service oriented jobs and those who exploit their position for gain. Do you, uh, do you want to elaborate on that a little? I think it's fairly simple. I think I would agree with a, a couple of the other contributors just now to say there is an argument for making uh, MP salaries sit alongside people like GPs or barristers or such, some such judges in the kind of 150, 250,000 pound mark. You even see local authority chief executives of that order of pay magnitude because they have a, um, a big set of responsibilities. And if you add to that the expenses minefield that they've got and the ability to, to run an office, then that needs to be taken into consideration. But I think there's a huge difference between, I'm gonna have a second job because A, I like doing it, B, it contributes to my own income, C, it kind of um, reinforces my own skill set, and there's some professional 
development issues that if I want to retain that as a job that going forward, I need to do at least some of those in it. Um, but compare that with some of the revelations recently when people are being paid um, extortionate amounts of money basically for doing nothing except taking that company's viewpoint um, and influencing government policy. I mean, there can be no doubt about the fact that that Patterson has been demonstrably proven to have done that. And that, that can only be done in a way which um, was for Owen Patterson and not for the, um, the country's benefit or the, um, his constituency benefit. And I think the last contributor said, well, let, let's expose all of these second jobs and we as um, voters can make a judgment on whether those kinds of contributions are valid as for the benefit of my constituencies or um, the nation as a whole, or whether it's clearly demonstrable as a way of exploiting that person's position as an influencer of government policy um, um, for his own, his or her own benefit. Uh, just such as we've seen with the PPE scandal that the Good Law Project is um, rapidly uncovering everything in, in that respect. Well, but so team, transparency, transparency is one thing and, and contribution is another. Robert, what's your own personal view on, on 81,000? Uh, is it enough? And like I said, I think there's an argument to say that um, it maybe should be um, more in parity with some of the highest earners that we've got within general commerce and public service, whether that's a GP. Um, some GPs don't earn anywhere near that amount of money, but uh, quite clearly some of them do earn in the 150 to 250,000. Uh, mark. Judges and senior barristers would uh, again be of a similar rank. So I think there is an argument to say, but I think without the transparency around yeah. Um, yeah. the exploitation of the lax rules of um, expenses, flipping homes, um, uh, charging the state for renting a property uh, whilst they've actually got their own property five miles up the road, it, it, that just grates and that's Blatant, blatant exploitation of the system. Um, and if any one of us were to do that um, with a, within a business or in, for example, local authority environment, you'd be, um, I think you'd be in jail, basically. <laughs> now I'm sure you're- I, I can't understand. Some of the things that we've heard recently have been around quite clearly. If I did that in a local authority, it would be against the Bribery Act. And there's, you know, strict regulations around the Bribery Act is what we can do. Whenever I take a contract out um, or um, um, respond to a quotation from a local authority to do a piece of work, I work in IT, I have to sign a form to say, the, here's my company's policy around the Bribery Act. And I will state every single year um, that I'm following that act. And it's quite clear some of the regulations around that. You cannot influence local authority members um, to do a thing in a particular way, except through that open competition route. Thank you, Robert. I, I, I want to thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to, if I may, to uh, get to Richard Bergen, who I know is extremely pressed for time. Richard, um, thank you so much for sparing uh, at least a few minutes for us and welcome. Um, uh, uh, let, let tell us just tell us about your bill. I mean, that is probably the best way of uh, of, of using your time because it's very it's fascinating and and we want to hear all about it. Well, it's my pleasure. Firstly, can you hear me? We can, and and lovely. Because sometimes technical difficulties do occur. Well, I was delighted to uh, present in Parliament uh, my uh, private member's bill to uh, ban MPs from having second jobs with certain very limited exceptions. So it introduces a presumption against uh, second jobs. Uh, and the very li limited exceptions uh, are uh, where it's to um, do a, a number of hours per year in order to, to maintain a professional registration, for example, in nursing, or where an MP is working uh, on the front line uh, in our NHS or, or in another uh, emergency uh, service. So it's to ban uh, paid second jobs. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a second uh, reading listed for the 3rd of uh, December. Uh, so the government needs to give it time if it's going to uh, progress. And so I would say that if the government's serious and if Boris Johnson's serious uh, about cleaning up our politics and they'll give 
uh, time to uh, uh, the second reading of this bill so we can have a full and frank uh, debate about it and get some real uh, change uh, in legislation on it as well. I mean, the two reasons I've brought it, uh, just to uh, say, uh, is firstly, being an MP is a very well-paid job. MPs often forget this, but MPs, because we're paid eight to 2,000 pounds a year, are paid more than 95% of people uh, in the country. Uh, and secondly, being an MP uh, is a, a full-time job, at least uh, a full-time job. So I believe that through chasing corporate cash, uh, MPs are shortchanging the public, but also undermining our democracy. And I think most MPs you speak to will, will say that whatever happens at the end of the working week, there's always something else you could have done, whether it be in relation to your constituency or in relation to your work uh, in Parliament. So the idea that some MPs don't just have a second job, but having six, seven, eight uh, extra jobs uh, beggars belief. And some MPs have said in response, oh, well, this allows us to have real life experience. But when Sajid Javid was getting paid before becoming health secretary, £1,500 an hour to advise a US investment bank in his second job, and the same amount of money again in his third job, I don't think that's accruing a uh, real life experience. I think that's making MPs less in touch, not more in touch, because one of the ways you remain in touch with the real world uh, when you become an MP is by talking to your constituents, by holding your advice sessions, by being out and about in your constituency, not by chasing extra earnings, uh, big money uh, from corporations. So that's the reason really that I've uh, brought this bill. I think the Owen Patterson uh, affair uh, shone a light uh, on this again for the public. And people are angry. I think most people realise in their own lives, in their own job, there's no way they could carry on with all these extra jobs, including jobs which potentially conflict with the job that they're uh, actually being paid to do uh, as their main job. So, so uh, that's a very exciting, Richard, about the second reading. Congratulations. And uh, that sort of begs a question. Are you, I mean, you must be talking uh, all, all, all around the comms about this. Do you sense there's any cross-party support for this? I mean, is it is it conceivable it could get a majority? Well, I put down an early day motion the other week which calls for a change to legislation or calls for legislation to be passed to ban second jobs apart from uh, the very limited exceptions I've mentioned. And that came in advance uh, of the private members bill that I drafted. Uh, and that so far has att attracted 40 MPs from, I think, you know, a number of different political parties. But I want to sh shine as much a, of a light upon the, this issue and say, look, MPs, many of them, recognise there's a problem. Mm. Uh, and this legislation, this private members bill, offers a solution to the problem. Here's some legislation. It can be passed and it will help to solve this problem. And what I would say is no one's forcing anybody to be an MP. You know, we're not stopping people from taking these highly paid consultancies and these big, big money jobs. But if they want to take them, they should step down as a member of parliament because being a member of parliament is a privilege. It's a very well paid job and it's at least a full time job. It's very interesting. I mean, it, it seems to me that I mean, what makes your bill interesting in, in, among many other things is it's is it's got a moral clarity to it. Um, the, the government's position, it seems to me, is 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 rushed, to say the least. I mean, what what do you make? I mean, like, patently, you wouldn't be bringing this bill if you thought that the government's position was sufficient. But what do you make of the way that the government has responded uh, since the sort of Owen Patterson debacle? I think that what the government said at first to sections of the public sounded good, but then you look at the reality uh, and it doesn't go uh, far enough. And the public's attention has been drawn to this now by all the discussion about the Owen Patterson affair. I think lots of people didn't realise how rife uh, it was, uh, the, you know, the scenario of MPs having uh, extra jobs on the side. I think it just offends wh whoever people support, uh, usually in a general election, whether they're Conservative voters, Labour voters, Lib Dem, or undecided. I think it offends people's sense of decency. They don't like it. They want to know that their MP uh, is devoting all their time and effort to the job of representing the constituents, and they also feel very strongly that this is almost to disrespect our democracy. 
you know, if you can have eight jobs whilst being an MP, then it suggests that being a, a member of parliament isn't very important. It suggests our democracy uh, isn't very important. And so something else I'd say as well is, you know, we've thought this, uh, you know, thought this bill through very carefully. It's not just a piece of uh, propaganda, it's meant to be a solution. You know, for example, one of the exemptions uh, in the bill uh, is where some someone is a newly elected member of Palm and, and have been a member of Palm for less than a month, and it's the job that they had when they were elected, which yeah. of course some people are surprised when they're elected as MPs and they need to be given a short amount of time to put their affairs in order, to wind things down, uh, you know, without breaching the contracts of employment that they had uh, with their previous employer. Because otherwise you'd have a bizarre scenario whereby people could be in breach uh, of, a, of, this, of this bill within a minute of being elected to Parliament for the first time, which would you know, clearly be ludicrous. Do you think this, I mean, it seems to me throughout this whole discussion so far, there's a, there's a greater question underpinning this, which, which is all about trust. And I suspect that that's one of your, you know, the purposes of your bill, correct? Oh, no, definitely. I want to, you know, restore or play my role in restoring as much trust uh, in our public representatives, in our democracy as possible, because when the public gets understandably cynical uh, about politics, that drives voter turnouts down. It makes people think they can't change anything. And we want a thriving democracy where more people participate. Uh, and we want to uh, restore, really, uh, the role uh, of MP to being one that people have, um, you know, a great respect for, not about respect for me or others as individuals, but for uh, the role. Uh, and I think this will help to, uh, it, will, it will help to do that. Well, uh, Richard, we're very grateful to you. We know you've got um, an extremely busy evening. So it, it's oh, always it, a pleasure. Thanks it's so great much. to see you and we'll, 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 we'll see you soon, we hope. Um, can I go to Zebedee, who has been making some very interesting um, points in the chat? Um, I don't know if Zebedee's there. One of our regulars at Thinkins. Why are you there, Zebedee? Sorry, Matt, I'm having my dinner, sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, let me, I'll come back to you um, when, when you've uh, completed your meal, if, if indeed that's in time. Um, let's go to Emma J then, um, who's also been busy in the chat. Hi, Emma, how are you? I'm all right, Matt. Good what to see you. Like um, you, you, you've asked a number of questions um, uh, and raised a number of points in the chat. So I just want to give you the floor, really, because they were particularly about, you know, the, the very interesting one about the the difference in the way hospitality is treated for ministers and MPs. And I just wanted to give you a chance to air those points uh, or indeed any others you wanted to make. That's very kind of you, Matt, but I don't have an answer about the ministers and MPs. I just picked it up when Boris was in front of the select committee. And it seemed to be raised and there was discussion on it so perhaps the, point being, the point being that can the, you, point can being, you... the point being i think that there was it was it was highlighted that minister the way ministers declare their hospitality is different to the way mps have to declare their hospitality and there was a backwards and forwards discussion about it and i actually didn't reach a conclusion and neither did the committee johnson said it was the same the committee members just seemed to suggest it wasn't so if somebody could clarify, that would be great. Um, the other point I think I did raise, which I do want to have a bit more understanding on, is, is this idea of appraisal, because it strikes me that you can go into office and have five years of doing a job, and nobody says whether you're doing a good job or a bad job, apart mm. from the electorates at the end of it. And I'm not sure that they are really voting necessarily for their MP as an election or voting for the bigger picture stuff. Um, and so I think... It is that that I think is interesting, that you can do a job and not be evaluated on how well you're doing that job. And if there's well, a way- Do you think 81,000 is enough, too much, too little? 81,000 sounds like an awful lot of money to me, mm. but then I'm not doing the job. And also I'm not motivated particularly by money. And that goes- but you, are, but you are, but you are, no, you're a voter. So you're in, you know, richly entitled to as much of a view on it as anyone. Yeah, and I think eighty one thousand pounds is a lot of money, but I don't know what the, what what it is it is doing or is involved. I've had friends who've been members of Parliament um, going back some time now, and I think they 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 enjoyed the job that while they were there, but to continue doing the job and raising a family, they left. Yes, and I don't know that it was 
because of money. I think it was also the other things that went with it. Yeah. Um, and sure. I think that's the most important thing. That, that, thank, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to come to go back to Hannah White um, because the um, the question of appraisal, it seems to me, is is fascinating. My my, my uh, fellow editor and partner, uh, Tortoise, is mostly uh, mentioned the idea of, of payment by results, um, which struck me in the chat, which struck me as as um, you know both a you know a, a, an idea out of the blue, but maybe rather a good one. Um, but Hannah, Hannah you, you, made, you made a really good point about the, the weakness of first past the post, which I'd love you to elaborate upon. Yeah, so I, I think in our electoral system, it's really hard to say that, you know, a lot of MPs will say, well, you know, my, my constituents get to judge me every five years or more often in recent years. At, at the at the ballot box, and they will take a view on whether they're ha happy with lots of things, my ethical conduct, whether I've been whether I had a second job or not, or whatever. Um, but I think that's really doesn't work, and is a bit disingenuous in a first past the post system, where it's very much winner takes all, and in certain you know, certain constituencies, a lot a large proportion. Um, Tom probably could tell us the figures of our of our constituencies are safe seats and so for long prolonged periods of time it is highly likely that the same party will um will win in that seat and 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 the vast majority of people don't really know who their mp is and aren't voting for the individual they're voting for the party so i actually think it's really wrong to think that you can you can just say the ballot box is enough of a um of a sort of uh a means for constituents to take a view on their MP because the, our, our system doesn't really allow for it. Interestingly, we have now got this, um, this, this act that was passed, the Recall of MPs Act, where in certain circumstances, if MPs do things wrong, constituents can potentially get an opportunity to, to say, actually, we want a by-election in between elections uh, because we, we want to take a view on this. Um, but that really is only happens in terms of like sort of criminal uh, behavior or, 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 or not um, claiming your expenses correctly and, and so on. So there's a sort of nudge in the right, in the direction of constituents getting a bit more say. But I think, yeah, in terms of appraisal, you'd hope that also parties would take a view on this, right? That when they think about which candidates they want to select for, um, to be the people they will stand in their constituency, that they would want the most effective people and I wonder whether there's a role for parties in this kind of performance assessment not but unfortunately I suspect that party whips certainly would would be choosing MPs on different criteria to that which we yeah, might so hope other people would be using. I, I think the appraisal system they apply is is is, is not necessarily geared to the, the common wheel um thanks Hannah well, um uh, can I come to Liz Mosley actually uh editor partner supremo international guru um Hi, Liz. Hello. You you made a really interesting point just now about motivation. Yeah. So, Go for it. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah. Emma just said, oh, I'm not um, very money motivated. And I think, um, you know, £81,000, as we've said, is a huge amount of money to most people. Um, I would be surprised if any anybody going to put themselves through the journey of becoming an MP is doing it for £81,000. I think there are people who really fight, get elected, work hard, and you can see them. The point I was making was you can, I, I think you can see them on the benches and you can see them on Parliament Live and you know, the people that are always there or the people that are regularly there and the people that are doing, you know, it's the whole thing. When there was that TV programme inside the Commons or something where they talked about this completely archaic and weird processes and the loops you have to jump through to get a question asked or answered. The whole thing is completely bonkers and maddening. And to do it well, you have to really grasp and care and energy and all of that stuff 
and live with the fact that you're getting bashed from every side and everybody thinks you're on the take and backhanders and all. So, but you can see the people who are doing it and who'll be delighted for their £81,000, thanks very much, and who, when they're not elected anymore, will go back and have a normal life and earn whatever they earn. And you can see the people who are thinking, quite fancy being an MP, probably can, you know, make that work, you know, top up my, my salary and then do lots of after dinner speeches for the rest of my life. I can pick them out. You, yeah. you, you, you. And I would love somebody much cleverer than me to be able to do some kind of combined quantitative and qualitative assessment. Because I know I said that thing about payment by results. I was just mischief making. That's obviously never going to work. But some kind of combined analysis that would be able to position somehow in a fair and rational and smart way what the motivations are of the different people who are drawn to this way of working because to be an MP a really good one also I made the point that not all constituencies are the same and you know like like vicars talk about this the the, the sort of diocese you're posted in the parish that you get different types of vicars do well in different types of parishes sure, yeah, different absolutely. types of communities and being an MP is just the same thing so it the, the selection process for the candidate ought to take that in mind who, what kinds of challenges this is in this community? What sorts of things are you going to have to fight for? Who are the people you're going to have to build relationships with? You know, it's really subtle and nuanced. And of course, the system, first of all, they're all paid the same as if it's the same job. It's not the same job. It's 600 and odd completely different jobs. So I suppose, I mean, we know this by the question, we, we, 81,000 pounds isn't the point. The point is, how do we get a better way of picking the people that are going to do the right thing by the people they're representing? And I anyway i just think that the, yeah i'd go in and i'd point them if you put me in charge i'd go and pick the good ones and kick everyone else out maybe that's the plan i think that might be the answer i think I we think might so too. It. i think so too yes again we've listed about it um thank you liz um can i come back to tom um tom i just want i, I, I one question i was wanting to ask you was um you know are we being very a bit coy and polite about this um in the sense that this is actually a party political problem uh, in that almost all the, the cases we've discussed and of course problems are in the Conservative Party. And this is because, you know, for all sorts of reasons, Conservative candidates have higher expectations of salary or have come from, you know, backgrounds where they have a certain expectation of lifestyle and so on, all the predictable reasons. Um, I mean, are we are we actually um, misrepresenting a party political crisis as as a structural one? Well, I, I rather agree with what Hannah was saying earlier that actually we have a political system, an electoral system, which which means that around the country there are a very significant number of safe seats. Uh, I just I didn't have the figures exactly in my head, so I did look them up, Hannah, uh, a few moments ago. But for instance. Uh, according to some research done by ERS a couple of years ago, there are 14 million voters or mi voters in, in uh, 14 million equivalent voters who in seats which haven't changed hands since the Second World War. Uh, another figure which I think uh, sort of reinforces the point about how, how many safe seats there are is that there are just about there are about 10 percent of seats in the UK where there is a 5% uh, or, or smaller majority. So if your, your definition of, of a safe seat is one which has a majority of more than 5%, uh, then 90% of the seats are safe. So as long as we have a situation like that, we will have what uh, very recent research has confirmed. Uh, and that is that uh, the overwhelming majority of uh, members of parliament who have second jobs are in safe seats and the MPs are in marginal seats, don't have second jobs because they have to work much, much harder to retain their, their seats. And that's what I did as a member of parliament. I held my seat for 22 years, but for each and every single one of those years, it was a marginal seat. And the only reason I think I held on to it was because I didn't have a second job. I focused on being a, a, a constituency member of parliament uh, almost exclusively, although as some people have referred to in the chat, uh, when you become a, a minister, as I did uh, for three years, then, of course, you end up being trying to juggle your or maintain the same level of commitment to your constituents 
as you do uh, with your new ministerial position. And sometimes that is that is hard to do. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we need to have a system where MPs cannot get elected to a constituency and then know that it is a job for life if they're in a safe seat. And until we change that, we might deal with this particular problem in terms of second jobs. But I'm pretty certain that in another 10 years time, we will have a different issue uh, that will that will again affect uh, trust in politicians, trust in politics, uh, doing damage to our democracy. So we've got to sort out uh, that question of safe seats. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Nick, can I come back to you uh, both on the party political question, but also on the greater question of what it means to be an MP, which I suspect underpins all of this, really? Yeah, so um, I think the, the point I was trying to make in the chat is that um, it's horrendously interesting for me, for me to listen to this, because um, I've been doing some work on the historic debates on this within Parliament, and almost all of these arguments are things that have been consistently said, at least since the 1970s. The debate on second jobs hasn't really changed, and this is the reason why every time we go through one of these debates in the 1970s, in the 1990s now, they're being consistently squeezed out. But I think one argument that you see in those historic debates that we're not facing up to now or not hearing is that one of the points of second jobs was not so much how much you earn, but that it was an assertion of symbolic independence from the idea of a full-time paid political class. The idea that you could walk away from being an MP and go and do something else and still earn a comparable living. And that that was the basis on which many conservative MPs, and it really was conservative MPs, this has consistently been a partisan issue, um, sought to defend second jobs. And I think the absence of that now is worrying because it means to me what we're doing is missing the wood for the trees a bit which is that we are not going to have in the future a parliament composed of even as many people with second jobs as now but what we will have is a parliament of full-time professionally remunerated politicians and unfortunately there is a legitimacy problem with that as well and i think that does not have the same clear and obvious solutions which have been outlined today which is that we're just going to ban second jobs eventually well, then what are we going to do about our professional political class that people don't seem to like either? That's abs absolutely spot on, I think. And, and um, it, it really sort of, uh, it, it, it makes me wonder whether actually we're asking the wrong question in the sense that um, this is only a subset of a, of a much bigger issue. I mean, I don't know if, if, if that's, if that's your view, but it, I, I, I take it from what you just said that it is. Yeah, it, it's definitely my view. I think that, um, yeah, we have, we need to have a broader debate about the value of politics and political work. Um, and I think this extends also to some of the other questions we've been talking about recently about the sort of abuse of MPs on, on social media and just in politics in general um, and the tone of politics um, that I think because of what I mentioned at the beginning that the the pay that you give to an MP is an assertion of their, so, their social value and the social value of politics. Um, and then in a sense, trying to sort of adjust the level of pay to change that is the wrong way around. That we need to start from an assessment of what we want politics to do and who we want politicians to be. And the pay issue will sort itself out at the end of that. Um, but that we can't do in a sense, you know, what we're, what we're quite used to doing, um, which is sort of fiddling around technocratically with, with pay. I think this has to start with a quite, as I say, philosophical debate about what we think democracy is for. Um, and if that sounds too philosophical, it's, it's probably why I became an academic rather than a civil servant. <laughs> well, I mean, on that on that question, I mean, it, it, looking at that uh, terrifying chair behind you, mm. uh, you mentioned before we started that you'd, you'd had a busy day teaching. Mm. And I'm fascinated, you know, when, when I was um, a student uh, and sitting in chairs like that back in the mid 18th century, um, you know, a lot of my peers already wanted to go into politics for, 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 all, for all parties. I mean, it wasn't, you know, Labour, Tory, Lib Dem, whatever. Um, are, you in, are, are you encountering bright young politics students who are, or indeed in other uh, faculties, who are, who are gearing up to become MPs? Because I, one thing that I sense is there's a generation that are fantastically politically engaged, have all sorts of, you know, really interesting views, of, 
you know, very consumed by social justice and so on, but don't necessarily see being an MP as a, a fulfilling or, 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 or realistic option. Yeah, I think this really depends. I mean, to be honest, a lot of, I think, uh, students I've encountered over the last few years, most of them have been on the left, the kind of students who act accidentally say we when they're talking about the Labour Party before slipping back into more neutral language. And they've just been tremendously scarred by the experience of Corbynism um, and the extent to which um, they sort of uh, viewed Corbyn as sort of unfairly maligned and, and sort of shoved out of politics or the opposite, that they were not fans at all. Um, so I think their experience of politics and, and going into it sort of actually does does not have that much to do with pay and has much more to do with the sort of internal politics of the Labour Party. Um, but yeah, that's that, that's probably getting completely off track. But I think the, the point about pay is this is always true. That really, people do not go into politics for the pay, but they their ability to stay there is conditioned by the pay. Um, and I think that's, again, the, the sort of... Um, the, the kind of question we need to focus on more than that recruitment question which will sort itself out because young people will always be idealistic about something um, and at least some of them will choose to go into organized politics to solve it I, I know tom wanted to come back in briefly tom do 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 please do so i just wanted to pick up on on something that uh, nick had said and and that is um, obviously, we're discussing salaries, but I think really uh, an even more important discussion is about the impact of social media on the willingness of people to stand. We recently carried out a survey of, of councillors and their absolute top priority in terms of what puts them off being a councillor is the level of abuse that they get on social media. So there's a real risk that it won't be the salary that puts people off standing as a member of parliament, but it will put off a very large number of women and ethnic minority candidates because they don't want to have to put up with the abuse they get on social media. So perhaps that's a discussion for another time, but I think that's a really important discussion to have. No, it, 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 tru it truly is, uh, Tom, and, 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 and absolutely. Absolutely spot on. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So very, very briefly, um, let me do my best to summarise uh, some of the, the points that have been made and some of the things we can take away uh, taught us as, as, as spurs to journalism. I think one of the things that, that's really excellent is that Richard Bergen's bill is now going to go through Parliament. We'll see how it does. But if nothing else, it will keep the debate alive. It will keep these issues in the media and it will force the government to reflect in a way that's more than one hopes um, lackadaisical upon you know what we've been discussing what have we been discussing well that seems to be the, the essence of the of, of the thinking really which is that the question I suppose is 81,000 pounds enough and there are there were a variety of answers I'd say there was a sort of slight a slight agnostic towards edge edging towards well maybe if judges earn up to 250,000 a year, maybe MPs could earn a bit more. But there was a unanimity amongst all the speakers that the key was to see this as part of a broader debate, which was, um, what is it, you know, as, 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 as Nick said, you know, what is an MP for? Um, and as Tom said, you know, what, what, you know what, what, how should they fill their time? And Hannah's point that, you know, it, you, you, cannot, you cannot dissociate this from the fact that we have an electoral system that doesn't really provide any form of appraisal or assessment. These are all these relate these all relate in a very intimate way, it seems to me. And I'm I'm powerfully reminded that the tortoise has been committed for a while, interrupted by the pandemic, as so many things were, to a, a, a process of considering what we call the rules, and which was really an investigation into not just the codification of the constitution, but the way in which power is distributed and the way in which the key roles within the political structure are considered. And it seems to me that this is, um, you know, a kind of encapsulation of it in, a, in around a single um, uh, monetary statistic and a very interesting one. And I think it, it, it encourages me to, to go back to that work that, that, that our co-founder James Harding began with the rules and, and, and to, to, to reconsider this issue within that context. Very conscious that this is going to remain a live issue. I do get the feeling that this is not going to go away. I, I think most of the, the people who spoke were su suggestive of, a, of a, a change in mood, that 
happen after parliamentary expenses as well. This is not just going to fade away. The train is not just going to clatter along. This does need to be resolved. Um, I'm hugely grateful to Richard, Hannah, Nick and Tom for their time. I'm hugely grateful to all of you for joining us uh, uh, at this thinking. Um, we have our uh, Future of Cities Summit all day tomorrow. Do please tune in for that. And um, we'll see you very soon. Um, and thank you again for uh, joining us on this most interesting evening. Have a great evening. Bye for now.